Uh, right. Well, hello, people of Cyprus. It's a pleasure being in blah, blah, blah. Thanks, sponsors. Done. Now, let's move uh, to some slides. I'm this senior citizen. I, I'm this old school new media guy. I, uh, I've been doing this for a while, and I, um, my role here is to be like a survivor, a, a witness from some you know, heroic period from the mid 90s. I'm the guy with a you know, muddy helmet from the front that comes and tells the war stories. Uh, I will be avoiding uh, quoting uh, cleverer people than myself, and um, all in all, my role here is uh, to be the artist. So this is, this is my old quote. You see, I'm a net artist. It's, there's, there's, digit, there's new media, then inside it somehow there's digital, and then inside that there's internet art, and then inside that there's net art. It's terrible. And I'm, I'm part of that little baby directory. Um, let's see. Why do we talk about internet art? It's exactly the same as any other art form that has anything to do with technology, since print pretty much. Uh, and there's this very useful book. So I, did I say I will not quote anything or anyone? I'll be avoiding that, I promise. There's this funny book written by an English person, and it is offering a useful, it's quite an easy textbook, really. It's offering a very useful um, way to understand uh, how media technologies uh, can be fertile ground for artistic experimentation and practices, but only for a short while, uh, until the particular media technology is domestified, and it's it's potential for disruption is domestified, it's like annihilated. And the thing I mentioned, this net art thing, was a practice that made a lot of sense at the time when internet didn't yet become the war zone it is today. Bang. So I can only talk about this and you simply have to believe me or you may choose not to but it was pretty much like this you know you would you would run you would do your shit and you would turn back and there was only your tracks in the snow we were the first to do everything and it was like super sexy and it's an unforgettable experience and that's the only thing that really matters when you work this is like roughly how that used to look i uh, just picked up some really old screenshots in ancient browsers and our stuff used to look like this. This is by all kinds of people. Uh, and this is not to talk about net art per se so much. It's more about how we got together and how we got organized, which is my humble attempt to uh, work together with the format of this whole event. Uh, oh, hmm. I thought I uh, skipped this slide, I deleted it. Um, this is one piece I have done. You might know in Germany here and then they'd make this exhibition, and it's called Documenta. And in 97, it was the one that included uh, net art, it, it included our practice. How cool. Um, and interestingly, approximately one month before the, the exhibition was closed, there was a big press release where they said um, that they're going to be taking down the website of Documenta and selling it on a CD-ROM in a museum shop. So if you, you know, if you want to see some online art, you have to buy a CD-ROM. Hey, Helen, you're here. Hi. Um, so I, I had a remark. Uh, at the time, we were talking a lot about the difference between private space and public space, and we all deeply believed, as I do, I still do today, that the internet should be open. Um, so the, what I did is that I made a full copy of that website, and in the evening, when the German colleagues came up with a press release saying that, okay, Documenta is over, and the website is now taken down, and it's going to be on sale in our museum shop, I retorted, I replied with another press release saying that actually that's wrong and Documenta is still alive and it's on my server, so the site is still there. So I, I practically stole this um, website and it was kind of something that never happened before and it was uh, a lot of fun and it became an important piece of net art. What do you want? Look here on the back. Okay. Okay. 
It's not that it's so important or anything. Come closer, there's some chairs here. Okay, I'm kidding. It's like a joke. And maybe you need the... I can talk louder, much louder. I'm being kind. I just had food, so I'm a little bit asleep. That's good. I should stand up, somebody said. My wife said, so I better stand the fuck up. Okay. Oh, yeah, I'm much more alive like this. Thank you. There's somebody who knows me well. But I cannot hold three mic... Four... How many microphones? Many more microphones than me. Okay. So anyway, that was the comment. I never mind that. This is uh, a little bit of a consequence of what we kids did 30, 20 years ago. Uh, a lot of careers, a lot of publishing projects, and uh, this is great for the ego. And even today, continuously, there's all these exhibitions everywhere in the world with my shit, and I'm like feeling rejuvenated. And sometimes I, I feel like this old musician that keeps playing the songs from the first album over and over again. So I avoid doing that, or at least I try to make it fun for myself. Uh, so yeah, this is cool. Every couple of months you get a book about you, you know, come on, it's cool. Um, oh, I do a lot of these talks, uh, but actually here, uh, the important photos are the one on top on the left, and the one here, Guggenheim, and there. Uh, my kid slept in all of my talks. And now she's 17 and you know, she knows everything about net art and she wants to be a Japanese chef. <laughs> like, it's like the furthest away she could get from what daddy does. How cool is that? So let's go down to our business. Uh, right now there's two touring exhibitions of digital art. One uh, done by two non-governmental organizations. Uh, one is Barbican, it's called Digital Revolution. It's super fancy, it's paid, by, paid for by Google, and it's like a huge spectacle. And there's another one done by Whitechapel, which is another gallery in London. And, uh, it's called Electronic Superhighway, all these names are big. And, and these are shows that include my shit and the work of my generation of artists. And um, uh, it's quite fancy. Now the first one is, was also in Athens, actually, I think this year or last. It's touring, now it's going to uh, China. And the one from Whitechapel just opened last week in Lisbon. So this is a really like a, uh, the ultimate canonization. Like our ship is now traveling the world in like this beautiful package. And we're as good as dead, you know. But you see, this whole thing, the way it's dealt with, is a bit of an insult. And this brings me finally to the territory of uh, this seminar. Uh, the chick is, uh, can you get this? No, you can't. This, is, this slide is the reason why I was hoping to put, pull up the projection. Um, you see, our work was not only about making those little digital things, files. It was very much about how we work together. So we invented the way to deal with ourselves and our dialogues and whatever we did was a, a, some sort of an attachment or a trampoline for those dialogues. Um, and I think it's a very important thing to say, uh, simply because there's people who make conference about this. So, let's go into that. Uh, this first expression, uh, this, uh, this is my attempt to avoid quoting people, trust me. This first expression comes from a wonderful chick who just died, I read recently, Eleanor Ostrom. I'm sure new theory people know her somehow. She's an economist, but uh, uh, this, 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 this expression, community of practice, is, is, is massively useful if you want to become educated in, uh, in, in this arena. And I believe our work somehow uh, inadvertently illustrates quite well that thing. But uh, more sincerely, uh, more accurately, we were actively inspired and also in personal dialogue with this, uh, this crazy American pirate radio guy, Hakim Bey, who came up with this concept of temporary autonomous zone. And, and our work somehow functions, for us at least, it used to function better in that theoretical framework. But as I said, I'm, I'm escaping that. So, I'm going to jump now and I'm trying to keep this inside the time frame, right? I'm being super kind. I, um, I'm going to jump now to these three uh, mailing lists, Net Time and then Syndicate in 7-Eleven, which were somehow the space where our community exchange happened for the majority of the time. 
That time was the mailing list. We organized, uh, we, we, we founded in 1995. It was uh, quite a nice format. Uh, we met in Venice during the opening of uh, the Biennial. It's like an art fair every two years. It's lousy and it's, it smells bad. Uh, and uh, at the time, uh, there was this big uh, story, a lot of hype about Berlin clubs scene. And the organizers of Biennial asked um, some friends from Berlin to uh, organize a club event for the, for the opening of, of, of the Biennial. And what they did, they did a 72-hour rave party. You remember rave parties? That was in a big, beautiful Baroque theater. Uh, so you could like dance in this nice place. Uh, at the bar there were waiters uh, like Josef Koschut, you might know that name, Marina Abramovic, some chick. Uh, they, they all participated in this and on the top floor we had a 72-hour conference about internet theory, critique and art. And that was a founding point of net time. We made a deal to uh, institute a mailing list uh, a key personality or a couple of key people were a Dutch guy, Gert, Gert Loving. He's really mad. And now he's collaborating with uh, this here spot uh, in a wonderful new European project with a funny name. Uh, and another guy was Pete Schulz. He's genuinely crazy. I think he's a fantastic person. And in that group, they gathered what, what it was maybe 15 of us who sat there for three days. Uh, but it was a, a nicely mixed bunch of people who dealt with early, early media art. We somehow already knew each other vaguely. And I think it was a very sweet moment. What happens with Net Time uh, later is that uh, it, it became quite a key thing, I believe. Uh, for several years, it was the only place in the world where you could seriously discuss internet uh, with other people who knew what they're talking about. So it wasn't like some pontification or some, you know, nano-imperialism or something like that. Uh, and that time functioned like this. There was a mailing, mailing list, but it was a community. We used to meet more or less every two weeks in another festival throughout Europe, which was very fine. Um, things like the next five minutes uh, in Amsterdam or Dutch Electronic Arts Festival in Rotterdam or Ars Electronica, that's spelled A-R-S, no E. Uh, then uh, that's in Linz, where uh, Adolf Eichmann is from, you know that, uh, logistics expert, uh, and uh, other festivals. And we have also published a number of publications, uh, most of them in 96. Uh, I was co-editor of a few. In 97, we organized the one and only Net Time specific conference, otherwise we were hacking at people's events. And I brought this thing that's kind of rare, and you can, you know, only the strongest among you can touch it. I will leave, I will leave a copy with this uh, venerable institution here, so you will be able, uh, of course, after you acquire white gloves, you will be uh, 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 able to live through it and see how it is. It was designed by my beautiful wife. <laughs> uh, it was a terrible night, one night of work, terrible shit. And then uh, I think the last thing of net time is uh, in this here black, awful, god awful black, black book. I had to do a design with somebody else. Uh, worst mistake of my life. This is a, a catalog of my show at the Venice Biennial also, but I, I piggybacked, my, I, I hacked, I, I, I smuggled net time in my own in my own book, so I have only a few pages of my own and the rest is net time. So you can check this shit out. But what happened uh, sometime in uh, mid-97 with, with net time was that um, it stopped being a community and it became an audience. And we were just chatting today over some croissant with almonds. Um, the very first signal that something is wrong with that mailing list was when our friends and colleagues, typically from the universities, uh, started sending their posts, their little essays, to proofreading before sending them to our mailing list. And that was like this ultimate insult, like zero immediacy. It was, all, it was becoming strategic, it was becoming a career thing and not any more uh, dialogue and exchange and like enthusiasm driven thing, let's change the world, let's change the way people make art, let's change the way people look at art and so on and so on. No, now it became a career thing. 
Okay, so that's next time. Let's move to see. Am I good with time? I'm trying to be. Uh, are we halfway there? Are we good? Okay. A bit over half. Good. Thank you, young man. Uh, so, in parallel to next time, uh, several months later, actually uh, within the framework of that same conference I mentioned in the next five minutes, in early '96, uh, the guys from a uh, media gallery in Rotterdam called V2, uh, that was not named after German uh, bombs, but it's something to do with the address, V Street number two, uh, a German guy called Andreas uh, Brockmann, who was very imperialistic at the time, still is, uh, decided to make a mailing list called V2 East, uh, which was really how, like, uh, from there uh, they see the Eastern European media art and stuff like that. It was um, actually uh, kind of uh, interesting at the moment uh, for, for, for a time uh, because it was an opportunity for very many new uh, media labs that were opening, you know, of Eastern Europe to promote their stuff, but as a matter of fact, very quickly it became something like a bulletin board for what these people are doing and not so much a space of dialogue, but nevertheless it became also a platform for a lot of actually quite useful writing, you know, chronicling Eastern European uh, new media scape. Uh, so it is valid after all, but it was not interesting for artists to be there because of art. They were there just to get an idea who is organizing what show and to brag that they are in those shows. So it was a bit of a side dish. And it worked for quite a while. They also published several several publications. Uh, typically these were uh, photocopied books in 100, 200 copies maximum of, of posts, of essays from the mailing list. But this brings me to the worst list of them all, of course, the one I'm the most proud of. Uh, when we were very unhappy with the way net time is, um, let's say, ossifying, becoming a very rectangular washed space, something like this marina here, you know. Uh, actually, this uh, horizontal stratigraphy of this city is more or less like this. Next time was like this here part of, of, of this city where streets are a little bit crumbling and you never know what's going to happen around the corner and, and then you suddenly enter that uh, uh, commemorative uh, space of, 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 uh, of Marina where everything is super beautiful, sanitized, inhuman and algorithm driven and it's horrible. Um, so we decided to do something about it and um, we uh, met in Linz, uh, this arts uh, festival and um, four of us crazy people, Jody, Alexei Shulgin, Heath Bunting and myself, we said enough of this shit, let's, let's make a proper mailing list as it should be. So, so this crazy guy Heath Bunting, who I think is uh, somebody everybody here should meet and spend their life with, he's that cool, um, came up with a name, as you might well know, 7-Eleven is a chain of little shops. So very soon, not more than a day after we were founded, we already got a cease and desist letter from the lawyers, so we knew we were on the right track. Uh, the mailing list was um, not exactly a tool to protect you against spam, it was a spam machine in your life. So all kinds of, uh, let's say, email brutality was not only allowed but stimulated. I was posting in Slovenian and Serbian, so just to see the reactions. Uh, he what Bunting used to unsubscribe and resubscribe everybody five times a day. And we have done all imaginable kinds of evil mischief. Because back then, nobody did it. It was a fine challenge and uh, everybody enjoyed it thoroughly uh, uh, for a while. But of course, it became obnoxious. I remember maybe two weeks after we did this list, this guy, uh, he became really very important later, Hans Ulrich. August, uh, he's a curator, uh, he uh, insisted uh, that we put him on the list and he unsubscribed maybe two hours later. It was, uh, it was yet another uh, sign we were doing really good uh, and uh, I insist this list is, is something to be proud of. But unfortunately, uh, it is completely useless for a gallery, it is impossible to display in a biennial, there is no way to collect it and put it in a beautiful catalogue of your recent acquisitions. 
It's quite hard to even understand what the fuck it is, but it was pure joy. And I think we, you know, we have approached net art nirvana with that thing. Uh, there has been a PhD recently by some uh, female person in England. I haven't read the final report, but I saw some chapters because I was sending the archives and shit, and it looked promising, but I, I failed to follow up. Okay. So that was 7 11. But still, you see, uh, even that thing had to stop, and I think it lasted not more than hello, how are you? There's many microphones you can choose. You see, here, this one, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. don't worry. Cool. Um, uh, so, after approximately a year and a half, I believe, uh, it stopped working. We decided not to uh, have that type of fun anymore. And uh, sometime in 98, Mm -hmm. 99, 98, I think 98. Uh, we met the same group, minus Jody, uh, didn't come that time, in Canada, in Banff. That's like this place in the mountains where artists go to die. It's like this way too beautiful uh, artist res in residence program where you just have a swimming pool and a forest and sushi grows on trees and it's like amazing. And you cannot do work because it's way too cozy. Uh, and anyway, we met there and we had a conference called Curating and Conserving New Media, which was all about these big American museums buying and collecting our shit, you know, big deal. And uh, there we made a press conference saying, net art is dead. Oh, shockwave through the art community. Nobody gave a damn. Gave it damn. And um, that was the end of our mailing list. And we, uh, I think that that was a very clever gesture because it elevated our price, you know. <laughs> And so now we are walking zombies, uh, like I say about myself, I'm a Jimi Hendrix that failed to overdose and things like that. Um, so let's see, where does it take us? Uh, uh, and I'm trying to conclude now. This is where I am now. Uh, I like to uh, define my own position because this whole talk was about a, per a position of the artist in the whole ambiance where you try to find your place in the society, influence it, make holes, and do such stuff. I, I define my position like this. I, I, I work, uh, I, I still run the artistic career, let's call it like that. I have shows all the time, uh, and talks like this. Uh, one other career is uh, consultancy uh, with, with digital matters for politics and for corporate world and for culture and NGOs. So I'm, I'm doing this lobbying thing all the time. But my genuine value set, you know, the skeleton of my thinking is still deeply, uh, uh, let's say, rooted in this good old individual anarchism, you know, it's those wonderful people who used to throw bombs at, at kings in the late 19th century, great times must have been. Anyway, I'm, I'm doing that, but by lobbying, so I, I, I work with, you know, the president of Slovenia or prime minister or now in Croatia. Uh, a similar format of people, and they like my advice, and we, you know, work on digital products and shit. And I actually managed to smuggle in some nice, evil, irreversible changes in their agendas. And you know, it happens to be working, and there's cases and cases. But you're not from my part of the world, so I will not remind you of some names. Oh yeah, there's a Slovenian consul. Yeah, Daniel Turk campaigner was my job. Not a bad job. The first one, the successful one, the president. Yeah, whatever. Uh, who's from Croatia? Nobody. Good. No, no, no examples from Croatia this evening. And, and I've dis I'm discovering that this, this um, uh, tactics works. So it's, it's my own answer to the question of where to put myself in order to generate impact. And I have found out that squats used to be the answer but are not anymore in my very private, you know, cosmology. Uh, and so I put myself somewhere else for that impact to happen. So where I am working now, this is a little bit of a marketing plug. Uh, I, I work at Narieka, which is a city in Croatia, and I work at a project called European Capital of Culture. It's like the one you just had in a nearby tourist village of Paphos, and I hear it was a disaster. Um, we are learning from, uh, from your uh, fantastically lousy experience and uh, trying to make it even worse. Uh, I'm not going to advertise seriously, I just wanted to, to kind of give you my coordinates uh, where I am. Uh, but of course, all of that will be possible if we survive this here guy, uh, but you know. And that's it for me, this was the slides I prepared, they're in color, thank you.